So if you're a bit familiar with user interfaces in games, you probably know that they can look very different. While 4X or strategy usually focuses heavily on heads to convey all the necessary data, a lot of games aim at making this UI more discreet, or even remove it completely by integrating it inside the game world itself. But did you know that, from the point of view of a game maker, UIs very often rely on the same concept, no matter the engine you're using? And yep, Godot is no different. The keyword here is nested containers. Oh, and just as a quick side note, if you want to get some exclusive game dev rewards, and in particular special ghetto assets, then you might want to take a look at my Patreon. We've just hit the 40 members mark, and this is amazing, because I've launched it just a couple of months ago, and I'm so thankful to all of you for your support. So yeah, be sure to have a look if you want some unique rewards, and you want to help support the channel. But anyway. In Godot, containers are special types of control nodes that place the child nodes according to various options to fill in the interface automatically. And because those parent containers allow us to let the engine place the child nodes for us, they're a great way to create flexible and responsive layouts that adapt to the screen size dynamically and are thus compatible with various platforms. So basically, by recursively nesting containers inside the containers, and then actual display elements at the end of this UI hierarchy, we can easily create pretty complex HUDs that still adapt nicely to various screen shapes. And that's why today I'm gonna tell you about the most common types of container nodes in Godot, and how to use them properly in your games. Alright, first of all, let's talk about the most basic Godot UI containers, the HBox and VBox containers. In short, those align their children nodes either in a row or a column. So suppose that we want to lay out this level select screen, where we have those three level panels next to each other. Then you see that by nesting those three elements inside an HBox container, they're instantly placed in a row. We can easily change the order by rearranging them in the hierarchy, and if we hide or show some of our level panels, then you see that the row automatically updates accordingly. And yes, of course, if we were to switch the type of our container to a VBox container, then our elements would get auto-placed in a column instead of a row. But okay, so let's say we have this row, this still looks a bit weird, cause for now, our panels are all stuck together in the middle, and the drop shadows even overlap in a pretty strange way. So one of the important properties of HBox or VBox containers is this separation value given in pixels that sets the spacing between each child element. Okay, that's better, but we're not there yet. Cause it doesn't look very professional to have those level panels be of different widths and heights, right? To solve this problem, a quick and easy solution could be to set a custom minimum size, and more specifically a minimum width, on all three cards. By using a value that is at least the width of the currently wider child element, we'd basically make sure that they all take the same space in the row. Now, that's nice, but it kind of goes against the whole responsive principle that we discussed before. This value of 400 pixels here works well for this screen size, but it won't always. That's why another more powerful technique is to rather use Godot's auto container sizing options. So let's say that we remove our custom minimum size, you see that the container auto shrinks the child panel elements to their previous uneven sizes, and so now we're going to have our HBox container stretch to fill all of its parent area with this full rect anchor mode. So now we can play around with the alignment property of our HBox to stack our cards differently in the row while still keeping the spacing we defined earlier like this. And so typically we can put them in the middle of the screen in a responsive way. And now for the real trick. If we select all of our child elements and go to the layout section, then the container sizing subsection, we can toggle on this expand option to have our nodes instantly stretch to all take the same percentage of the space. Which means that we've now got a completely responsive layout that properly divides the screen into three equal columns and spreads our child elements evenly along this row with some spacing. Of course, if we want to add some padding around these elements, we can nest our HBox container into another type of container, the aptly named margin container, that has some theme overrides for the left, top, right, and bottom margins. Oh, and also, if you ever want some element in an HBox or a VBox to take more or less space than the others, then simply tweak its stretch ratio property. The higher this value, the more space the element will take relative to the others. And finally, just as a bonus, 
To give you an idea of how a V-Box container can be useful, each of those level cards is actually based on one. So in short here, I first have a panel container, which is mostly a styling utility for the background, the border and the drop shadow. And then inside I have a V-Box that allows me to stack all the info in a column. As a quick follow-up to the HBox and VBox containers, let's have a look at the Grid container. As the name implies, this is a pretty similar layout system, except that it handles a grid of child elements. So let's assume that we have this other kind of level select screen with a bunch of little level cells. By putting them inside a grid container, we can auto-place them in this layout, and as usual, if we show or hide some of those elements, the others instantly reposition as expected. Then we can change the columns property of the grid container to set how many items can be stacked in a row before a new one is created. And we can play around with the independent horizontal and vertical separation values to set the spacing between our child elements. Also, just like before, if our grid container stretches to the entire rect of its parent area, then we can use the expand properties of the child cells in the horizontal direction, the vertical direction or both, to have these elements spread and divide the space evenly on either axis. Finally, Gado's grid container of course adapts the width or the height of the rows and columns based on the largest element in each one. So if we were to force this cell to be bigger by giving it a custom minimum size, then you see that the rest of the grid updates to keep everything neatly lined up. To wrap up this tutorial, I want to give you a quick overview of the other most often used UI container nodes in Godot. Now, there are a couple more in the engine, but I think that with the HBox, VBox and grid containers that we already talked about, plus those six ones, you should have everything you need to get started with your Godot game interfaces. Okay, so first off, we have the panel container. We already touched upon it briefly in the first section. It's a nice styling tool for a group of elements, because it auto resizes to encompass its entire sub hierarchy, and it has a style property that you can use to apply your very own style box and set the panel's background, borders, shadows, corner radius, and more. Then there's the center container. This is a very simple container. All it does is recenter its content in the middle of its area. Every direct child node will be put at the center, so if we have multiple elements like here, they will overlap. Now, this may sound a bit weird or even useless at first, but in fact, it can be pretty cool if some of those elements have a dynamic size. Cause this way, no matter how the child visual shrinks or grows, you're sure that it will always remain centered on this position. Next up, we have the margin container, which we also picked at previously. It's the easiest way to put some spacing around some elements in your layout and nicely adjust the blank spaces. Then the split container is a pretty specific and ad hoc node type, but if you ever work on a more editor or desktop like UI, or if you want some of your panel's proportions to be dynamic in-game, then this container can definitely be of interest to you. Similarly, the tab container is quite self-explanatory. It helps you create a set of tabs to easily switch between several content panels. There are quite a lot of options and styling parameters that you can tweak, and the tabs and content panels that will be shown simply correspond to what you put in your hierarchy. The name of the first level children will give the tab names, and the content in each of those determines the UI to put in each content panel. Finally, the scroll container is the go-to solution to implement any kind of long scroll list. Just give this container a VBox container child, and then inside add all the items that you want to scroll through to instantly get an easy to customize scroll list. In the end, you see that thanks to Godot's built-ins, it's actually pretty easy to create advanced and yet responsive UIs in your games. But tell me, would you like me to talk about other UI components in the engine? Like how to create dropdowns or cross-platform scrolling lists, or cute interface animations, or even how to use shaders to create custom visuals? If you're interested, feel free to tell me in the comments down below. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and take care!